Thank you for being here today, everybody. My name is Brandon Christie, and uh, I'll be talking about a, a talk today that's called Realizing Potentials for a Beautiful Society. Um, and basically, as we sat down to think about what kind of approach we wanted with this event, we knew we wanted to discuss the humane potential that goes wasted under the limited and outdated social framework of today. We decided on beautiful instead of potential because it's more accurate in portraying a flourishing, vibrant vision of society. And the potential that is referred to here and of critical importance as a matter of implication, an implication for society that emerges when you take holistic account of all the coinciding developments happening out there, all the developing technologies. And um, it's not really about the potentials alone, but taking it in relationship to each other, you know, in relationship to each other, it's the holistic account of everything together uh, that implies a greater social context. Actually, MLK had a great quote on this holistic account of our social condition. He said, a fact is merely the absence of contradiction, but truth is the presence of coherence. Truth is the relatedness of facts. In order to get to the whole truth, we've got to see, bring the other side into being, you know, this holistic, uh, holistic picture, this whole picture, seeing the interconnection of events, behaviors, phenomena pertaining to society, of course. And again, it's the implications that we draw which define us. When one poses the question of what a beautiful society might be like, what one imagines it to be, you might notice a lack of positivity and imagination around the idea. Our minds tend to think of it in terms of being free of some condition, the absence of some ill, um, you know, the absence of some injustice, being free of some social injustice. And it's not to say that we don't need to resolve and free ourselves of many critical flaws which harm. And this lack of imagining a future society in a creative, positive light, um, in a positive state, not just a negative one, free of some um, injustice, uh, may have more to do with just how limiting our social condition has proven to be than any incapacity to imagine society in these terms. It does take a lot to conceive of that which does not exist yet. The future, things that do not exist, are hard to conceive of. What does exist is a market system of economics that is unsustainable and the cause of a lot of needless suffering. We all know the system. We all experience the climate out there. We all know what we want to move away from. We all know the issues, unsustainability, needless suffering, corruption, ignorance, war. And at the same time, what we also have is an immense technical capability to alleviate our human condition of these burdens and in institutions, really, uh, to facilitate what is nothing less than a historical, pivotal shift in the endeavor of human society, when you're really looking at the holistic account, again, of all these developments, in our ability to deliver economic means abundantly and efficiently, freeing the social condition to flourish. And I'd like to go through some of the beautiful potentials, if you will, of our society here. Our two potentials for the core economic functions of, functions of food production, water, energy harnessing, remain largely unrealized in absorbing modern methods of post-scarcity capacity. First off, it should be stated that current food production is already, already produces enough to support all human beings on Earth. Anyone can see how much food is wasted. There's already enough food being produced. It's just a matter of economic efficiency to deliver it to the population. Um, that's a wasted potential, obviously due, again, to these inefficiencies of the, uh, inefficiencies of the market. Beyond that uh, reality, though, there's immense potentials, again, for you know, soilless methods of vertical farming requiring uh, dramatically less water, land, and labor, um, less energy to run, can be utilized right here in the city of Los Angeles. And actually, uh, this is an example of uh, tree, you know, vertical farming right here these massive facilities, uh, paraphrasing actually a hypothetical from Peter Joseph's book, The New Human Rights Movement, which actually he did a, a ton of research in this very library for his work, this, this book, The New Human Rights Movement. If you haven't checked it out, you can check it out. Um, but he, did, he had this great point on uh, just this uh, topic, vertical farming, and he said, 
paraphrasing here, Columbia University worked on vertical farms and determined that to feed 50,000 people, you would need a 30-story building, it's pretty high, um, the size of a New York City block, which is about 6.4 acres, and extrapolated you know, that to, you know, translating that to the city of Los Angeles, it would take roughly 78 such 30-story structures to feed the local residents for a total of 499 acres, which is about 0.1% of the total land area of LA to feed the population. So this stuff is very minimal, um, efficient, and um, possible. This stuff is being done right now. It's just not scaled out to society. Potentials in water treatment share the same dramatic efficiency, uh, embarrassing efficiency, given you know, the state of the world today. We, we have these things just on the sideline. Combining methods of purification, desalinization with fresh water, and use, reuse methods uh, with, with uh, water treatment could bring water availability up to a level of, of abundance so desperately needed to alleviate water scarcity uh, that's affecting so many people across the world. I think over two billion people across the world are affected in some way of water scarcity. Right, so moving on to renewable energies, geothermal, water, hydro, wind, solar, tidal. Uh, we know about all these, you know, renewable, it's, it's well known by now that these things can, you know, make energy cleanly, abundantly, uh, minimally, and, um, and to the point where it, it becomes very hard to charge you know, money for it. It, it kind of transcends the very framework that we have anyway. So to kind of frame all of our, all these uh, developments within the old framework is to, to frame all these developments in an old framework, which could transcend the framework anyway, is really um, frustrating to see. Uh, most recognize these potentials though, these renewables, the new technical methods coming forward, the AI trends, artificial intelligence, the minimal, small, domestic scale, macro scale applications. People see merit in use, share arrangements of tool or equipment libraries. Uh, people see the minimalism and the beauty and elegance and design and efficiency. People see these developments without necessarily seeing them in terms of an integrated, again, holistic system. It's this synergistic integration of such available alternatives that a new social condition begins to emerge where resources are no longer uh, necessarily scarce where poverty and economic inequality is no longer inevitable, that we are, we are not in deficiency anymore, and that we can move past this framework of just surviving and uh, create a condition where we can begin to flourish as a society. With the economic essentials of food and energy met in society, what are some other characteristics we might imagine the foundations of a flourishing world to be? Um, incorporating natural and functional beauty into society, right? Bringing nature back into, into the community. Uh, but in a functional, educational way too, a dynamic way. Creating a world where people love to learn, where we have dynamic, enjoyable educational systems um, to engage throughout your, your whole life. You know, also a world, again, that is automated, that frees human beings for a more meaningful and authentic vocational contribution. We want to create a world which is transparent, obviously, democratic, participatory, which takes care of society as a whole, yet props up the individual to become a better individual, and one which is sensitive to the values and culture being cultivated, removing mechanisms, going back to Gerald's talk on ideology and methodology, and mechanisms, removing those mechanisms for corruption that take society in the wrong direction and, and, and culminate behaviors based on its very framework and incentives and motivations and relationships of the system. Uh, removing those mechanisms for corruption and concentrated power, which do nothing to lead society. You know, these, these, this concentrated power as if it's leading society, you know, as, as if it has some functional role, actually just restricts restricts the flourishing and evolution of, of society. It's also creating a community element in society, cultural diversity. I think in a beautiful, flourishing society, people and you know, cultures would flourish more than ever. You know, a lot of people get concerned that when you talk about creating an abundant, efficient society where things, people's needs are met, that there'd be some kind of homogenization or you know, uniformity. 
And you know, if you haven't noticed, that's basically what we have now. I mean, it's extreme uniformity out there. Everyone driving to work uh, Monday morning, you know, to go to their jobs, and everyone's. So I won't even go into it. the consumerism element. There's a lot of uniformity out there, but again, I think there would be more cultural diversity, you know, than ever before, than ever seen, in a again flourishing free society. And this isn't utopia, you know. This isn't. Um, and there's a lot of uh, comments these days where uh, people will defend, you know, this type of vision for the world. So this is not utopia. It's the free market is a utopia, and that, you know. Who can't disagree with that? Um, you know, the only utopia around is the free market, which assumes this final stage of you know human economy as if it's you know doesn't need to be changed at all. This is this final final stage of uh, human organization. But yeah, this isn't utopia. This is this is a fundamental vision for society. This isn't just about aesthetics and well-trimmed lawns, but flourishing in all aspects of human existence. Okay. Realizing beauty in all aspects of human life. Flourishing as a concept, like freedom and democracy, can't just be proclaimed, right? But enabled and designed into society to be functional. It's a matter of reorienting, reorienting society to be functional in a humane, scientific and technical, logical uh, framework, which understands nature, that's intentional, with the intent to align the basic operations of society with sustainability and efficiency to meet the needs of people and the environment. Society would be a meeting ground for ideas. You know, don't we have that now with the political system? No, we actually really don't. There's you know, so much um, undermining of the political governing process and actually sharing ideas. You, you can't even share ideas actually anymore. So this would be a fundamental aspect of society, you know, a meeting ground for ideas and having that just a core aspect. And these principles, principles can be incorporated and carried out through mechanisms such as politics, open source collaboration or education, and the technical arrangement itself. Uh, just as we have financial mechanisms which lead, lead to ecological indifference and political mechanisms which corrupt, we can create sustainable, humane mechanisms that lead us to positive outcomes. You could call it mechanisms of the future mechanisms, frameworks developed from principle that enable structural shifts in society to where it can embrace this larger, you know, Green New Deal, this larger green, humane, abundant, collaborative shift. In a beautiful society, well-being, education, and vocation, your ability to you know, contribute to society in some way and, and be needed and, be, and vi be vital to your society would not be debated as some questionable anti-capitalist agenda, but fundamental cornerstones of any functioning society. As Phoenix talked about, education you know, is, is a bedrock, should be a bedrock of a, of a society. Society can only flourish as much as the wisdom of its citizens allow. We can't just assume knowledge will carry on to the next generation. We have to impart it appropriately and convey knowledge and wisdom gained from all of us having lived it and walked it in this time, to pass along a sustainable thought and understanding and ideology. If we, want, if, if we don't, there is no guarantee the next generation will have any kind of compass or context for how to live. Learning is an experience. We must activate our intrinsic curiosity within the learning environment. It should be an overall positive experience, right? But it should also use small doses of, di of discomfort so students can understand deprivation and the suffering of others, and teaching students how to work out problems and how to, how to deal with problems and, again, share ideas. <clears throat> Physical spaces, it's the, uh, the library here, physical spaces would also be a centrally considered aspect. In a beautiful society, physical public space would be designed to encourage communication Interaction, socialization, you know, empathy, thoughtful discussion, incorporating, again, the natural beauty elements, functional relationships with nature. It, it, it would incorporate education as well as with museums, art, center, art centers, naturally. And this is also kind of something I've thought about for a while, too, which is, you know, in a free society where sustainability was a core, a core uh, aspect of it, um, 
you know, the ecological health and biodiversity could become a form of collective creative expression, you know, a form of art almost. Um, not only being sustainable industrially, but actually enhancing ecological health and diversity, enriching it as a creative act or a form of you know, social creative expression, if you will. It's uh, you know, this, the ecological health and diversity of the planet you know, as a form of art. It's a beautiful kind of concept that might take hold. You know, should we ever overcome the stress, the survival stresses, you know, which you know, hold back so much human beauty you know, and, and potential? Our humanity is uh, held back by these old systems. Society is clearly uh, destined you know, for something greater than the current condition. But the key to unlocking this inner beauty lies in realizing the common ground we really do share in the pursuit of a decent life. Focusing on what we have in common more than our differences. This is where the true latent potential for radical change lies. You know, the vision is clear. Arbitrary, petty, ideological differences must be transcended to unify around fundamental principles for society, fundamental principles. While certain framed economic ideologies and concepts are helpful for people to grasp and understand concepts of equality, socializing aspects of society, and the flaws of capitalism, they can also divide and cloud what should be an objective course for humanity to take. It's very important to talk in terms of this train of thought, you know, this in terms of a, um, a unifying framework, you know, fundamental principles that go in to creating a, a stable, functioning society. You know, common ground, becoming unified. <sighs> a general cultural agreement, you know, again, around these fundamental principles. It could seem so obvious, sustainability, you know, equality, science designed into the social system you know, reducing corruption. There's these, this core set to be realized and to be unified around. Everyone is so hard-lined out there, though, you know, closed thinking still. Many have closed, hard-lined, absolutist, exclusive, you know, you're wrong because of some arbitrary reason. It's this way and that's just that. You know, and it's even for those people who feel that they're informed and on the right side of things, it's, it's interesting how... Um, we can do more harm than good, even when we think we're on the right side. So it's, it's very important to maintain an open view, very important. Having conviction for what you know is right, based on your experience, but also being vulnerable to new experience and to new information outside of your own, own experience, taking on different perspectives, listening to each other. Very key in, in uh, you know, cultivating this common ground. Another key component to realizing this beautiful shift is to demonstrate the technical models and redesigns of these post-scarcity capacities. You know, you could launch, you know, when I say technical redesign, I literally mean like inviting scientists and um, economists and engineers and uh, you know, sociologists, uh, programmers, all just the whole, opening this up you know, globally, launching it as a widespread global project inviting university, universities in on it, and um, involving even movements, you know, social movements on this too, all over the world to participate in an open sourced, collaborative, um, you know, aggregating type of data um, project, you know, how, how to solve society, how to effectively organize a holistic life system based on technical and natural resources. You know, a system that is provably unsustainable, um, isn't emergent, doesn't value truth, doesn't value knowledge and sharing, and likes to gaslight the issues and reframe an entire oppressive social condition to make the oppressed somehow the fault of their own oppression. A system that wants to keep deceiving and exploiting each other needs to be overcome and to, move to be moved away from. And of course, we need to understand its structure, dyna structural dynamics to know what new systems to implement. We have to move away from a system of promoting arbitrary assumptions, worldviews, and reactions, as opposed to intentional, structured, empirical, reasonable ideas, away from emotional and opinionated approaches to social concern and identity politics. The potentials are within reach, 
And we must reach for something beautiful in this life. What else are we here for? You know, what are we doing here? We must reach for something beautiful. Otherwise, we will become what apathy begets. If we want to realize true change, we have to see past what we now have, looking past old systems to see where we want to be. We have to get past just always framing and filtering our progress through old systems and old narratives. Have to get past acclimating and adjusting ourselves to historical abuses and just acclimating to it and be able to see what's possible in order to realize it. Thank you very much.